you would turn in your Bibles to uh, Acts chapter 2, Acts chapter 2, we're going to look at some of the closing verses. Actually, our text is verse 42. Suddenly realized that I didn't uh, write down in my notes where I wanted to begin reading, but I'm going to start in verse 37. I hope that's around the area. <laughs> and read through uh, verse 47 just to get the context. But again, verse 42 contains what we're going to be looking at. <clears throat> Acts 2, beginning in verse 37. Again, this comes on the day of Pentecost after Peter, uh, filled with the Holy Spirit, preaches the gospel. 3,000 are converted. Uh, in the process here, we, we pick up the narrative in verse 37. Now when they heard this, they were pierced to the heart and said to Peter and the rest of the apostles, Brethren, what shall we do? And Peter said to them, Repent and let each of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. <clears throat> for the promise is for you and your children and for all who are far off, as many as the Lord our God shall call to himself. And with many other words, he solemnly testified and kept on exhorting them, saying, Be saved from this perverse generation. So then those who had received his word were baptized, and those there were added that day about 3,000 souls. And they were continually devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And everyone kept feeling a sense of awe. And many wonders and signs were taking place through the apostles. And all those who had believed were together and had all things in common. And they began selling their property and possessions and were sharing them with all, as anyone might have need. And day by day, continuing with one mind in the temple and breaking bread from house to house, they were taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord was adding to their number day by day those who were being saved. May the Lord bless his word to our hearing this evening. Now again, let's not forget uh, what it is we're looking at. Uh, we're looking at, at a study on how we are to overcome our sins and how we are to grow in grace or put on the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've seen so far in, in the study, we've seen several reasons why we ought to be seeking these things, but we've also considered the different means by which uh, God gives us the grace to be able to do this, to be able to grow. Uh, the first thing I believe we saw was, well, it, it had to do with not indulging in the world, not letting the world quench that grace. And that really has to do with what we looked at last week as well. We went on to see the importance of praying, that we do need to seek the Lord continually. I mean, really, God has given to us access to his throne. We can ask for whatever we want. Whatever he's promised, he said he will give to us. So let's use that. One of the things he's promised to help us do is to put to death our sins and to grow in grace. And so we were encouraged to pray continually, to pray fervently, to pray humbly, but to pray in faith, expecting that God will hear us and he will answer us. Uh, we saw the importance of reading the word, but again, let's not be deceived into thinking that if we just you know, keep maintain our Bible reading programs, that that's all the Lord has in mind. Sometimes if we read our four chapters, if you're you know, doing the McShane uh, Bible reading program, it's about four chapters a day. It may only take you 10 minutes to read through it, but 10 minutes in the Word isn't really that uh, effective if what you hear just passes through and then goes into oblivion. You don't remember what it, what it actually said. What we need to do is read the Word of God and receive what the Lord is actually saying to us in the Word and respond in faith to each particular part. And that includes, of course, believing what it says, as well as embracing the promises that we are going to lift up to the Lord in prayer. Uh, trembling at threatenings because there are actually uh, warnings given to churches, to those who profess faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, even as the one I just mentioned. Don't be hearers only, but doers of the word. 
but also, of course, submitting to those commandments. We need to take what the Lord says and we need to apply it to our lives. It's not enough just to know it. We have to live it, and the Lord has given us the grace to be able to do that. And of course, that fed into the next thing that we needed to do, which is worship the Lord. As Paul reminds us in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, that we are not to be conformed to this world, but transformed by the renewing of our minds. We are to offer ourselves as living sacrifices, which means everything that we do is to be done for the glory of God. Even as Paul says, whether you eat or drink or whatever you do, do all to the glory of God. Sometimes we look at that verse and say, well, I guess I better watch what I eat and drink. But it's not just eating and drinking. It's the small things and the large things as well. The Lord does not want us to be part-time Christians, but full-time Christians. If we're part-time Christians, we're going to find we're going to be unprepared for the opportunities God gives us to serve him. We're not going to be ready unless our mind and heart is already going that direction. So we need to be full-time servants. And of course, to do that, we need to keep ourselves free from the influences of the world because it quenches the Spirit's work. We need to remain free from sin. Now, tonight we're going to consider one more. We're going to consider fellowship. And as you know, we've seen many good reasons why we should fellowship. We're actually up to, to number 45. And I would again commend to you those, um, those reasons, those um, devotionals. I believe they are posted uh, on the web somewhere, and you can find out from our internet team exactly where that is. If you don't already have all the, uh, the, the blogs that have been sent out or those, those um, you know, they're automatically generated and sent out to you. But this evening, we do want to see a couple more reasons why we ought to do this and consider how we might do this most profitably. Now, in our passage, we, we see the early church, and we see what was going on in it. And one of the things we note here is the fact that uh, the early church, especially after the day of Pentecost, was selling their possessions so that they could give to those who were in need. And it says that they shared all things in common and so forth. We do need to be careful here because I don't think it's advocating a Christian communism. But what is going on here is the fact that with all these people who have come to Jerusalem in order to celebrate the Feast of Passover, and with 3,000 of them being converted, as well as the others that, as the Lord was adding day by day to the church, and the fact that they needed to be discipled before they returned back to their homes. I mean, somebody needed to support them. They came there only to celebrate the feast, and that was only going to last for a few days. But now they're saved, and now they need to be discipled. Now they, there are certain things that need to be done on their behalf. They need to be supported. Their resources are a long ways away. So the church begins to sell its possessions so that they can remain, and they can be discipled. But I want you to notice what this discipleship actually uh, is made up of. I think sometimes when we think about discipleship, what we think about is learning. You know, I need to learn. I need to understand what the Bible says. I need to grow in my understanding of doctrine. So I go to classes. I go to college. I go to seminary or whatever it may be. Certainly that's important. I do believe, I mean, what it tells us here is that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. Teaching is certainly a part of discipleship. To learn those basic foundational teachings of Scripture, and especially when you consider the group that was here who were converted, these were Jews, who knew the Old Testament Scriptures, but needed to understand how Christ was the fulfillment of those things needed to understand what God's intent was uh, through the work of Christ and what he intended to do with regard to the nations, all those things they needed to understand so that when they go back to their respective homes, they can plant churches. But that's not all discipleship was made up of. Look at, look at what else was in the text. There was also the breaking of bread. And again, I know many times we look at this and we say, they shared meals together. Well, we read a little bit later on that they certainly were doing that, breaking bread from house to house, taking their meals together with gladness and sincerity of heart. But in this particular instance, this breaking of bread is not just sharing a meal, but this is celebrating the Lord's Supper. 
And the reason why we believe that is because in the Greek there is the, what's called the definite article, the word the, which is not in our translation here. They devoted themselves continually to the breaking of the bread, which is, of course, a, you know, what do you call it, uh, a part for the whole. The breaking of the bread is referring to the Lord's Supper as a means of grace, as a means to build them up, as a means to grow stronger in their devotion to the Lord, which is one of the reasons why we celebrate it often. They were continually devoting themselves to it. We want to do the same thing. They were continually devoting themselves to prayer. You can't grow spiritually if you're not seeking the Lord, if you're not spending time with Him and communing with Him, not only in His Word, but speaking to Him, uh, praying and asking for His grace and His mercy. Jesus says, you have not because you ask not. So we need to ask continually. But there was one other thing that they were doing that was a component of their discipleship, and that is fellowship. That consists not only of all these things that, uh, well, that we've seen in, in this devotion, but, but other things as well. Now, we've already considered, you know, most of what's included in here, we've, well, at least half of it, we've considered what it means to devote yourself to the Word of God and how we need to read it so that we are grounded in the Apostles' teaching. I mean, what is the Apostles' teaching? New Testament. We need to understand that. We need to understand what the basis was of their doctrine, which is the Old Testament. We need to understand the Word of God. So we've looked at that. We've looked at prayer. We haven't yet looked at the breaking of the bread. We're going to consider that, Lord willing, next time. But this evening, we want to consider fellowship. And two things in particular. Uh, what fellowship is and how we are to fellowship. So first of all, what is fellowship? Now again, fellowship is more than just hanging out, you know, hanging out together. Uh, if two Christians are together and they're talking, it doesn't necessarily mean that they're fellowshipping. Uh, fellowshipping is much more than simply talking, especially if the subject is not um, you know, spiritual things. Fellowship, the, literally the word means communion. You know, the word koinonia, I think you've heard that many times. We talk about koinonia, that's, um, well, it's fellowship is what it is. Uh, when Christians get together, we call that koinonia, at least it is if it's going the right way. But it is a sharing. It is a sharing in something that the Lord has given to each one of us to share. It is a sharing in one another's graces. Grace is that spiritual gift that God has given to you that changed your heart. It's the work of the Holy Spirit, and it really is made up of several different things. But we might, as we, you know, before we get into that, we might consider fellowship to be the ministry of the body of Christ to itself through the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, David writes this in Psalm 133, verses 1 through 3, which is essentially the whole psalm. He says this, Behold, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity. It is like the precious oil upon the head, coming down upon the beard, even Aaron's beard, coming down upon the edges of his robes. It is like the dew of Hermon coming down upon the mountains of Zion. For there the Lord commanded the blessing, life forever. Now, I've already made an allusion to this imagery before. Sometimes when we think about this oil being poured on the priest's head and it just pouring on down his head and all, down all of his garments and so forth, we just kind of shudder at the thought. <laughs> well, look at all the laundry that has to be done now. He's got all this oil in his hair. He's going to clean it out and so forth. But that's not how they would view this. I mean, it was a blessing to have your head anointed with oil. Uh, that's something that someone might do to, um, you know, to comfort somebody. Um, but that's not what's in view right here. What's in view right here is the idea of anointing of the priest and that anointing oil, which is basically representative of the Holy Spirit, anointing the priest to be able to do his work. Now, it's really a picture, though, of the one who is the great priest, who is the Lord Jesus Christ, and the fact that he would be anointed with the Spirit. And with that anointing would give his Spirit to his people. 
communicated to his body, the idea of it being poured on the head, the head being Christ, and then going out to the members of his body or flowing out the edges of his, of his garments and so forth is that oil flowing from the head to the members of the body. It's interesting how um, David actually likens that to Christian fellowship. You know, how good and how pleasant it is for brothers to dwell together in unity or in, in love, that bond of unity. It's like this oil flowing from the head down to the members, you see. And that's exactly what the Lord Jesus Christ does for us and what gives us that love and blesses us in this way. Now again, as I mentioned, uh, Christ is the one who does the work and he receives the Spirit of God in order that he might give the Spirit to his church. And he gives the Spirit to the church for a couple of different reasons. First is to empower her to do the work that he has called the church to do, which is to fulfill the Great Commission. But one of the elements that actually accomplishes that is the ministry that we have toward one another, the ministry of the body to itself, to build it up, to make it strong enough to do this work, to do the work of the Great Commission. Again, sometimes I think we think, you know, well, here's this, you know, the Lord gives us the, the Spirit of God and we just kind of go out. We have this outward look and we try to reach out to the lost and bring them to faith in Christ. But the Lord wants us also to have care for each other, to minister our gifts to one another, to build each other up. Well, that ministry of using the gift and that, that grace of the Holy Spirit to each other within the body of Christ, that is what fellowship is. It's actually made up of several elements, all of which nourish, strengthen, and build up the body. As I said, it is a sharing of those graces that God gives to us, and those graces can, and I think, well, it probably be divided into three areas, love, faith, and spiritual gifts. And really all of those things resolve into one thing, and that is the Spirit of God dwelling in our souls. If we want the strength to overcome our sins and to put on the Lord Jesus Christ so that the Great Commission can move forward, and by the way, that's the whole, that's the end, or the goal behind putting off the old man, putting off our sins, making no provision for the flesh, and putting on the Lord Jesus Christ. It's not just so that we might become like Jesus, that's just you know, one step toward the goal, the goal is that we would actually fulfill the Great Commission, that we would actually do what the Lord has called His church to do. In order to do that, we need fellowship. We can't do it without it. So let's consider, secondly, how fellowship builds the body. As I mentioned, you can divide it up into three different areas, faith, love, and gifts. First of all, fellowship builds up the body through encouragement by one another's faith. I don't know if you ever thought of the fact that the Apostle Paul himself needed to be encouraged by the faith of the body of Christ. In Romans chapter 1, verses 9 through 12, he, he writes this as he's you know, writing to the church at Rome and uh, hoping to be able to come to them. He says this, For God whom I serve in my spirit in the preaching of the gospel of his son is my witness as to how unceasingly I make mention of you always in my prayers making request if perhaps now at last by the will of God I may succeed in coming to you for I long to see you so that I may impart some spiritual gift to you that you may be established that is that I may be encouraged together with you while among you, each of us, by the other's faith, both yours and mine. Now, I remember I was in one church that was, you know, the, the charismatic leaning. Uh, the pastor believed that that passage meant that what Paul wanted to do is he wanted to go to Rome so he could lay hands on people and give them spiritual gifts. But that's not exactly what he's saying here, is it? He says, that is, you know, this idea behind coming and imparting a spiritual gift, that is that each of us might be encouraged by the other's faith. The gift that they both had was the gift of faith. And of course, that can be extremely encouraging and it can build up the body 
when you have faith. I mean, it's very encouraging. I think we've already been exhorted through one of the devotionals that Greg wrote. It's very encouraging to be around somebody who has a strong faith. When your faith is weak, what is it that helps you get stronger faith? Except when you see somebody who trusts God, who maybe is going through a difficult time themselves, and yet they have a promise from God that he's going to help them get through it, and they believe it, and they trust God. It's encouraging to see that. Or when you're um, even just struggling with um, you know, whether or not these things are real, to spend time with somebody who has a strong conviction, who has strong faith and can see those things clearly. And you can see in their life, and you can see in, in just their attitude that these things are real. I mean, it's extremely encouraging. I remember when we were in um, college that there was um, a uh, unique individual. Uh, there aren't too many people like this around who came to speak at the chapel during a missions emphasis week. His name was uh, Joseph Tan. I'm not sure if he's still living or not. I mean, he's living either on heaven or uh, either on earth or in heaven. But his faith in the Lord Jesus Christ was so strong. I mean, when he spoke, because of you know, the persecution he had gone through, and it, it gave an intensity to his, uh, to his Christianity. And uh, when he spoke, I mean, you could literally hear a pin drop. It was, it was just it was so intense. As a matter of fact, uh, one time we went to um, uh, hear John MacArthur. Uh, he was uh, defending a book that he had just written, and um, we were encouraged by MacArthur's ministry, so we thought we'd try to do something that would be an encouragement to him. We got the tapes of those lectures by Joseph Tan, and uh, we gave him a set, and, and so as he's rushing for the door after the... Uh, after this, the lectures were over and so forth, we stopped him, and he, he turned around and looked at us. He said, we just wanted to give you these tapes. And he, goes, he looks at him and he goes, what are they? Well, these are lectures from Joseph Tan that were, you know, were given at the college he went to. And he goes, Joseph Tan? And he literally just reached out and grabbed the tapes and pulled, <laughs> took them out of our hand and then turned around. <laughs> he goes, thanks, you know, and he, and he left. He goes, we've had Joseph Tan come to our church several times, and he's always an encouragement. Yes, it, it really is encouraging to be around strong faith. And of course, fellowship is where we share that faith. We have communion in one another's faith so that we might be encouraged together. You know how it is when you're by yourself a lot and you're not around people of faith. Your faith can grow weak. You need to be together with the people of God. We need to have that fellowship to strengthen one another's faith. And the same thing is true with regard to love because love is really what is behind faith. It's, um, uh, Paul tells us in Galatians chapter 5 that saving faith works by love. And the stronger this holy love is in your heart, the stronger that faith is. But again, that's something we share in fellowship. Paul says in Galatians 5, verses 13 through 14, For you were called to freedom, brethren. Only do not turn your freedom into an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, in the statement, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Now, being around strong faith is certainly an encouragement, but being around strong love also is very encouraging. It's very edifying. It really builds up the body. I mean, just consider your own experience. If you're around somebody who is filled with the love of Christ, how that feels what an encouragement it is to you. When you see a strong example of love, it makes you want to be that way too. It makes you want to strive after that. I was thinking, um, well, I was thinking about an example. Uh, it's just one that's, well, it's, it's fictitious, and I suppose, but it's still kind of encouraging to see that in some of the renditions of, of the uh, story of the book, Les Miserables, where um, Jean Valjean's life is transformed by the kindness of a, of a priest who after he steals the priest's silver, he's caught by the police and brought back to the priest, and the priest says, I gave it to him. And then as the police are dismissed, I mean, he would have gone back to prison for the rest of his life because of that theft, but the priest didn't want that to happen. And the priest says, I, of course, this isn't right, but I bought your soul for Christ with this silver. Well, anyway, whatever happens, he, he, it transforms his life, and his life becomes one of continuing benevolence, of giving, of love, toward others that, that are in a similar situation to him. And just to see that encourages you. And of course, to see the example of Christ, which is so much greater. 
that he would come into this world and lay down his life for his enemies. Do you know the love of Christ? And have you experienced that love? I mean, just seeing it encourages you to do the same thing. But experiencing that love and knowing that that love is yours is also extremely encouraging. It, it builds you up. Being around people who have a strong love builds you up in love. Just like being around people that don't like you. <laughs> you know, makes you feel less, <laughs> less love. Being around people who have a strong love certainly builds it up. So in fellowship, though, we are to share the love that the Lord has given to us. That love is what actually binds us together. It's what creates unity, the unity that David was talking about in that particular psalm. And as we, you know, as we spend time together loving one another and being loved by one another, it, it does strengthen us. It strengthens us emotionally, but especially spiritually. It's something the Lord gives us to share with one another. And so how do we fellowship? Well, first of all, we, you know, we encourage one another by a mutual faith and then also through this love. But of course, the one thing we often think about when we think about fellowship is the sharing of the gifts that God gives to us, the spiritual gifts, of which a strong love and a strong faith can certainly be one. But that's what Paul has in mind when he talks about the contribution of the body. Actually, he has all these things in mind. But what we saw in our devotional or our meditation, but speaking the truth in love, we are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ from whom the whole body, being fitted and held together by what every joint supplies, according to the proper working of each individual part, causes the growth of the body for the building up of itself in love. Now Paul tells us here that each member of the body has a particular function. He tells us in 1 Corinthians 12 and in Romans 12 that, that those functions are really the expressions of gifts that God gives to us. And as we use those gifts within the body of Christ and minister those gifts to one another, the whole body gets built up. But it, it requires the proper working of each individual part. Every joint has to supply what the Lord has put it there to supply. And that, of course, depends upon the gift. Now again, each of us has a gift, each of us has love we are to share, each of us has faith that we are to share, but we also have a gift. We may have the gift of service, and if so, we need to serve. We may have the gift of encouragement, and obviously if we do, we need to encourage. Or giving, give, we need to give. Exhorting, we need to exhort or admonish, that is, call one another to repentance and to amendment and to do the right thing. If it's a gift of teaching, we are to teach. A gift of preaching, we are to preach. A gift of leading, to lead. And of course, showing mercy, which is an expression of love. All of these really, in a, in a way, are an expression of love. But we are to do that cheerfully. Now we are to take that gift, Paul tells us, and we are to administer it or minister it according to the faith that the Lord has given to us. Each of us has a measure of faith. Each of us has a measure of faith based upon, I believe, the love that the Lord has given to us for him. Love generates this faith. The more faith that you have or the stronger your love, uh, the more powerful is going to be the exercise of that particular gift, the more of an impact it's going to have on the body. And the more powerful the exercise of our gifts are toward one another, the stronger the whole body is actually going to be. And the stronger that the body is, the less we're all going to sin, the more we're going to be like Jesus Christ, and the more the kingdom is going to advance, or the Great Commission is going to be fulfilled. And so we have faith, and we have love, and we have gifts, and we are to minister those to one another. That builds the body up. Now here's a few things to consider that uh, might be helpful for us to do that. Uh, first of all, as we've been reminded through at least 45 times now uh, through this uh, uh, devotion, in order for this to work, uh, we actually do have to meet together. 
So it's important that we meet together for fellowship. We must not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. Uh, the author to the Hebrews writes in Hebrews 10, verses 23 through 25, let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. And let us consider how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds, not forsaking our own assembling together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. So in order to facilitate fellowship, we have to be together. We have to well, not forsake the assembling of ourselves together, obviously. But secondly, we need to make sure that when we get together, that we're getting together for the right thing, that it actually is for fellowship, which means we need to set aside the things we might otherwise speak about on other days and other contexts with other people and focus on the things that the Lord would have us to focus on. In other words, we need to leave the world at the door. Actually, the Lord helps us to do this by giving us an explicit command, and that is to keep his Sabbath holy. That's the fourth commandment. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Now, a day is a unit of time, and that's holy time. And what does it mean when something is holy? It means it's set apart to God. That means it belongs to him. And what the Lord wants us to do is actually to set that whole day aside that we might spend it with him. Now, in order to do that, he's also given us other directions in Scripture, not to have a divided mind and not to have, of course, divided conversation, not to keep bringing things in that dilute that, you know, that would divide our hearts, our affections between two different things. He actually, even the things that we might legitimately think about on other days of the week, we're supposed to set those things aside, too, so that we can focus on the Lord. That's really necessary if we're going to be able to fellowship in the way that the Lord has called us to fellowship. The Lord wants us to give him our full attention, and he wants us not only to focus on him, but on one another. He wants us to experience on this day a foretaste of heaven. And really, the more we experience of that, the more we're going to long for heaven, but also the stronger we're going to be here spiritually. And really, what is it that gets in our way? It's typically one thing. It is the world. Again, John Bunyan's going to address that in Pilgrim's Progress when uh, Christian and um, I think at this point it's faithful uh, enter into Vanity Fair. Vanity Fair is a representation of all those things that are going to draw us away from the Lord that are in this world, both things sinful and things that are not sinful, but become idols to us because our love and affection for them are just too strong. The Lord wants to break that affection and have our hearts set upon him, which is why he tells us to set this one day aside to remind us that we are just pilgrims passing through this world, that all these things that we think are, are so important are all going to one day be taken away from us. And heaven will be the only thing remaining. He wants us to remember that that is our destination, heaven and not this world. This is not where our home is. Our home is in heaven. So if fellowship is to be effective, we do need to leave the world out. Otherwise, we're doing the same thing we do the rest of the week, and we're actually circumventing what the Lord wants to accomplish on this day, which is to get our hearts and minds focused upon him, upon heaven, and upon building up one another with gifts and graces, one of which, of course, is a clear view of heaven and the fact that we're heading there. That's what faith is all about, or a strong love for the Lord. Our love is basically expressed by our devotion to him. And if we're not really talking about him or focused on him at all, it doesn't really do much to build one another up. We've got to focus on him. Now, as I was thinking about this, I was asking myself the question, when we get together, why don't we fellowship more than we do? And we do fellowship to some degree, but I think you'd, agree with me that we can always do better. And what are some of the reasons or what are some of the things that get in our way of speaking about spiritual things? I mean, sometimes we find it very difficult to talk to one another about spiritual things. Well, here's a few things that occurred to me. One is perhaps fear of pride or at least coming across as being prideful, you know, putting on airs. I mean, you might think that if you, if you 
speak about spiritual things that uh, others might think that you're trying to be more spiritual than you ought to be and so forth. Uh, we do need to be careful that we don't let the fear of pride cause us actually to sin by not doing what the Lord commands because what does the Lord want us to do on his holy day except build one another up with our faith and our love and our gifts. Another thing might be <clears throat> another, you know, not the fear of pride, but pride itself, which is if I do this, I might show somebody how little I know. Or if I try to encourage somebody, perhaps I'll fail. And so we don't try to do it because we're afraid we're just going to be inadequate. We do need to realize that nobody can do it perfectly except Jesus Christ. And we're all going to fail to one degree or another. But I hope you would admit with me or agree with me that it's better to try and to fall short than not to try at all because as you work at it, you get better. It's the same thing that stops us from evangelizing, right? I mean, sometimes we're afraid they're going to raise a question I'm not going to be able to answer. They're going to make me look like a fool and so forth, so I'm not even going to try. Well, the problem is if you never try, you never get better at it. Uh, you never gain that skill and wisdom in, in uh, answering questions or perhaps um, you know, learning how to focus on the things that would, um, that would be the, the best things to focus on, not to get drawn into arguments, but rather stick to the gospel and continue to give it to them. Uh, another thing that might get in the way is a divided heart. We just don't want to strongly enough. And again, it's because the world is weakening us you know, to the degree that you give your heart to something other than the Lord, to that degree, you're going to be weaker. You're not going to have the strength that you need. We need to be careful that we have a single heart, as we've already seen. All of life is to be worship. We are to give ourselves as living sacrifices to God. And that means in all that we do, whether we eat or drink, whatever we do, we do it all for the glory of God. If we do that, we will have the strength that we need and we'll also have the matter to speak of. Even when we're talking about things that are going on out there, they'll have more of a spiritual focus to them because that's the level at which we'll be engaged in it instead of at the same level, the rest of the world is engaged in it. So if you have a divided heart, that can certainly stunt your ability to be able to fellowship. You need to draw your affections away from those things and place them all on the Lord. And again, use the means of grace to that end. Another thing that prevents this, certainly ultimately or absolutely prevents it, is the fact that you know, a person isn't converted. If you don't know the Lord, you don't have faith, you don't have love, you don't have a gift, and so you have nothing really to share. And if that's the case, the only solution to that is to turn from your sins and to trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And then, again, maybe something along the lines of inadequacy. I, I thought another reason might be that we just are ineffective. You know, we just don't feel like we're doing, you know, we're, we're able to really accomplish much when we do that. Maybe it has the opposite effect of what we're attempting to do. And that, that might actually be another reason. Sometimes we try to engage people at, at this level, and they just don't want to talk about it. Well, that's something we can't do anything about except encourage them. If you have the gift of exhortation, exhort them <clears throat> to talk about these things because that's what the Lord would have us to do. But sometimes we might actually try to do something and find that we can't do it very effectively because maybe we don't have that gift. If we don't have the gift, we really shouldn't try to exercise that gift. I remember watching uh, when I was actually one of the seminary professors brought this video in that was, was helpful. It was a, um, a pastor who was talking about uh, how not to get burned out, and I think we all need to learn how not to get burned out. But the way he was suggesting was when you try to do something that you're not gifted to do, it will burn you out. But if you, if you stay in the realm of your gifts, then you will be able to keep on going longer, as it were, because it's less effort for you to do it. And that is true. I mean, a person, let's say, who uh, has uh, you know, maybe athletic gifts is obviously going to be able to you know, do things athletically more than the rest of us that don't have those kinds of gifts. We're going to burn out more quickly. The same thing is true in any other area as well. So perhaps if we're ineffective, it's because we're 
We're seeking to do things that we're not gifted to do. We need to know what our gift is and use that gift that the Lord has given to us. And don't just trust your own judgment on that. Ask others, what do you think my gift is? What have you seen you know, in me that appears to be a strength that I might be able to use to glorify the Lord? But there's also another reason we could be ineffective, and that is because perhaps our faith, our grace, our love is weak. And so the gift doesn't have the impact that it might otherwise have. I think you'll agree with me that when your faith is strong, when your love is strong, when you are filled with the Spirit of God, that whatever gift you have that you exercise, it has much more of an impact than when you're weak and you're divided and, and you're struggling and so forth. It's, it's hard to accomplish anything. So if you're ineffective because you, your grace is weak, well, use the means of grace, one of which is fellowship. Be with the people of God more. Spend more time in the Word. Spend more time in prayer. Give your life more to worship. Have less of a divided heart. Try to bring all your affections to the Lord. Give yourself entirely to Him. Now, in closing, let me just say this, that uh, all of us should be exhorted to fellowship. It's something the early church devoted itself to because of its importance. Discipleship is incomplete unless there is this involvement in the body of Christ, in the exercising of gifts and the receiving of gifts. This isn't all just about giving. This is all also about receiving. We need to give and receive. We need to share. That's what communion and fellowship is all about. It's a sharing. You give and you, you receive. I was going to say take, but it's not take. So realizing that all of us have a certain measure of faith, all of us have a certain measure of love, if we're believers here this evening. And all of us have at least one gift that we should use those things that the Lord has given to us according to our ability. I mean, what does the Lord have in mind when he talks about talents and minas and the fact that one uses them and gains more and another takes it and doesn't do anything with it except <clears throat> you're using that gift in a way that profits the Lord. But how do you profit him with that gift? Well, there's, there's two ways, basically. One is by ministering to the body, to strengthen the body so that it becomes stronger, so that it is able better to fulfill the Great Commission. As the kingdom of heaven advances, then our Lord Jesus Christ is benefited. He is profited by that. Or if your gifts relate more directly to reaching out to the lost, when you exercise the gifts in that direction and you bring more people into the body of Christ and it becomes stronger because there's now more parts and more workers and the kingdom of heaven advances, then you benefit him in that way as well. So it's using the gifts that God has given to you, gifts and graces to profit him. That's what's behind the talents and the minas. And that's what's behind also rewards that the Lord has promised to give you on the day of judgment when you take your gifts and you use them in this way to benefit him. So in closing, make sure that you are a believer, that you've repented, you've trusted in the Lord. Identify the gift that the Lord has given to you. He's given to you at least one if you're a believer and perhaps more than one. Strengthen that gift through the means of grace. It really does make a difference. How much you're in the word, how much you apply it by faith, how much you pray, how much you devote yourself to the Lord makes a huge difference. And then purpose to use that gift by gathering with the body of Christ and using it to build them up. As you do that, you will be strengthened. The body as a whole will be strengthened. The kingdom of heaven will advance. The lost will be saved. And God will be glorified. I mean, in essence, that's what Christianity is all about. That's what the Lord wants us to be doing, involved in these things so that the kingdom of heaven will advance. Everybody benefits. The lost benefit, we benefit. Our Lord gains those for whom he laid down his life. But if we don't fellowship, on the contrary, then the whole thing is weakened, things slow down, and the Lord is not as glorified as he might otherwise be. So let's be encouraged 
to devote ourselves to the things the early church devoted itself to because those are the means by which the kingdom of heaven will advance, that will grow stronger, and that we will have a fuller reward in that final day. May the Lord grant us the grace to hear it. Remember, it's not enough to just hear it. It's not enough just to know it or even to agree that it's right. We actually have to do this. We need to apply the Word of God to our lives and seek to live this as best we can. And of course, we can only do it through the power God supplies by His Holy Spirit. So we do need continually to ask for that and again, to use the means. Let's, uh, let's bow in a moment of prayer and let's ask the Lord to help us do that.